The Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago is beautiful, bustling, and bougie. It's home to literally the best restaurant in the world, the second best, I don't even know what that is, place in the US, and a ton of yuppies. I would know, I used to live there. I myself was a latte sip in Lincoln Park yuppie. I've been to that restaurant. I've also been to that pizza place. It's overrated, and besides, anything you have to eat with a fork and knife does not count as pizza. Anyway, Lincoln Park's story is not unique. How it became a beautiful, idyllic place, but also a gentrified yuppie haven, is a story that you could copy and paste for most major U.S. cities. It's a story that gets to the heart of the affordable housing crisis in America. It's a story of five little letters. NIMBY. Not in my backyard. Uh, NIMBYs reflexively oppose anything that's proposed anywhere near them. For the past 50 years, they've really kind of controlled the way that cities grow. Nolan is research director for California YIMBY, yes, in my backyard. He was also a professional city planner in New York City. We spoke to him to get to the bottom of the questions, why do cities gentrify, and what can be done about the housing crisis? There are about as many definitions of gentrification as there are people who have thought about the issue. I think what concerns people with gentrification is, is really displacement, such that property taxes are increasing and homeowners who might have been there 20, 30 years are feeling the pressure and potentially getting displaced. Or renters who their rents are going up because demand is rising are, again, feeling the pressure and potentially being displaced from communities where they were born and raised, where they have thick social networks. In Lincoln Park, like many other urban American neighborhoods, that means a declining percentage of minorities. Between 1970 and 2010, the share of Latino and Black residents there fell by half. That didn't just happen on its own. They were pushed out by policy decisions. If you heard about Bruce's Beach, you know how this works. Quick recap. 1912, a Black family, the Bruce's, buys a section of Los Angeles beachside property and opens it to LA's African American community, who weren't allowed to visit most other city beaches. White, upper and middle class neighbors harassed, intimidated, and threatened the Bruce's with violence. But still, they wouldn't sell. Those neighbors then did the next logical thing. They used the government, the social apparatus of compulsion and coercion, to do their dirty work for them. They petitioned the Manhattan Beach Board of Trustees, which condemned the Bruce's property in 1924 via eminent domain laws under the guise of creating a public park. The land went unused for 34 years before becoming the promised park. In 2022, the land was returned to the family, minus the massive increase in property value, of course. In Lincoln Park, that same approach. Hey, we can't bully people into leaving, so let's organize, lobby the government, and then it'll feel legitimate, is at play. Not actual violence, but the threat of governmental force has had the same desired effects. There were 3,000 fewer homes in Lincoln Park in 2016 than in 1950 while the Chicagoland area's population was almost doubling. That approach can be boiled down to one word, zoning. So zoning definitely is the keystone in the, in the NIMBY framework, for sure. Nolan knows what he's talking about. He literally wrote the book on it. Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City. It essentially does two things. The first is uh, it assigns every single uh, parcel in a city to a zoning district, and that district has two rules. First, what the permitted land uses are, and then what the permitted density is. So certain neighborhoods are reserved for detached single family homes. Other neighborhoods might allow apartments. Some neighborhoods might allow offices. Others might only allow uh, retail. The second big thing that zoning does is it heavily restricts density. So it restricts the number of units that you can build. In many cases, it requires parking. Uh, as I argue in the book, these rules have made the U.S. city uniquely dysfunctional. If you want to know why housing in American cities is so unaffordable, look no further. So most other countries, even with zoning systems like Japan or France, allow low-rise multifamily anywhere that residential is allowed. They allow those types of corner groceries, corner shops that people know and love uh, almost anywhere. The U.S. is really unique in the extent to which we, we segregate uses and restrict densities in urban areas. Density, people living close together, is great for a lot of things, but especially the environment. People who live in cities consume less energy. They're less likely to drive cars, more likely to take public transportation, less likely to live in too much house, more likely to live in cramped apartments. And most people want to live that way. 
You can tell sociologically by the skyrocketing 55% and climbing human population in urban areas and economically by the fact that property in Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles is way more expensive than property in, say, Wyoming. With one huge caveat, high prices are actually a great thing. They're a market signal. They're the free market's way of telling developers and builders, hey, hey, over here. But that caveat is high prices have to be allowed to fall to more affordable levels. They have to be left alone, in other words. Spoiler alert, in American cities, they haven't been. That's no accident. People who live in wealthy areas hiding behind government have used zoning policy to prevent supply from growing, which keeps demand high, which prevents prices from falling. Of course, the vast majority of Americans, even low-income Americans, live in what we might call naturally occurring affordable housing. So this is housing stock that's just affordable, maybe because it's older or it's small. Uh, you might think of housing working in the same way as cars, right? Most low-income people don't buy new cars. They don't buy luxury cars, but they are able to buy older cars that have cycled through the market, or they're able to buy cars that are inherently cheaper. Essentially what we've done in uh, the modern American city under zoning is we've stocked up the supply of new housing. So those older homes don't filter down and become cheaper over time. Is it just me or is this the epitome of hypocrisy? While making a boogeyman out of gentrification, blaming it for high rents, and promising to make housing more affordable, governments, especially left-leaning ones in major cities, enact policies that lead directly to gentrification, higher rents, and fewer available apartments. Rent control is the classic example. Affordable housing initiatives are another, like the laws or tax breaks incentivizing landlords to rent apartments to folks earning, say, 50% of an area's median income. This is freaking nuts. It totally distorts the market and works against the laws of supply and demand. And in these cases where the price of rent has been artificially lowered, there's less incentive, that is, less potential profit for developers to supply or build new apartments. So in the attempt to make housing more accessible, these policies actually make it less so. By the way, we love teaching economics, but we can't do it alone. To help us keep doing what we love in new ways and contexts, like this video and subscribe to Learn Liberty. Anyway, back to zoning. The second way that zoning increases housing prices is just by um, requiring the housing that is built to be more expensive than it might otherwise need to be. Uh, so requiring off-street parking spaces that could increase the cost of a home by $50,000. The third mechanism is just by adding delays and additional risk to the process. So all of these things, uh, it's death by a thousand cuts. It, zoning just makes it harder to build, forces whatever's built to, to be more expensive, and then delays whatever does get built. Um, so all of this, uh, all of these sort of NIMBY policies, you might say, increase the cost of housing. It wasn't always this way, and it's not this way everywhere. We'll get to the one example of a major city with no zoning at all. But let's stay with Lincoln Park for a second. If you go far enough back, a lot of its land was actually a cemetery. After the Chicago Fire of 1871, though, the area exploded in development, as did many other American cities. New York, Chicago, San Francisco, they grew into what we know and love today before zoning. For my part, when I visit those places, I love just walking and exploring. I love that incredible diversity of landscape, of businesses, of window shopping opportunities that you can see on just one city block. A great coffee shop next door to a late night Mexican joint, a ton of apartments above, a dental office, an upscale designer toy and art gallery right across the street. I swear that really exists. That's a major intersection in Lincoln Park, one block from where I lived. Could it exist if you had areas zoned for residential, as distinct from recreational, as distinct from commercial? Nuh-uh. Most importantly, in those major cities, you get the diversity of people that goes along with diversity of land use. So luckily for us, cities like Chicago and New York had the chance to grow before zoning laws got on the books. And luckily for us, a variety of land uses has survived, or been grandfathered in, despite zoning laws. In fact, pre-zoning urban areas are the exact kind of neighborhoods Nolan shows to policymakers in developing cities as an example of what they could be. In general, this will be a beloved inner suburb with pretty high housing prices because everyone wants to live there. And you might have a detached single family home next to a duplex uh, or down the street. You might have townhouses. You might have a, a small apartment building on the corner. You might have a corner grocery. That's Lincoln Park. In the early 20th century, it promoted itself as a suburb within a major city. 
and that's how it felt in the coach house I lived in. It was a single family home right behind a duplex with a gas station and convenience store on the corner. That variety and accessibility though are struggling to stay alive. If we had had zoning adopted 100 years earlier, New York City doesn't exist or Chicago for that matter. Chicago probably doesn't exist if zoning gets adopted 100 years earlier. When you show people the types of neighborhoods that emerged before zoning, people say, well, this is great. Uh, why is this illegal? Why can't our other neighborhoods start to become more like this? Because people move to a new area, then contrive bureaus, boards, and governments to enforce arbitrary regulations that keep others out. In Chicago, for example, in 1956, something called the Community Conservation Board made Lincoln Park something called an official conservation area, giving the famously corrupt Mayor Richard Daley power to seize, demolish, or renovate buildings on a whim. Moreover, the Lincoln Park Conservation Association enacted a strict enforcement campaign. Staff were encouraged to tattle on apartments that appeared to violate zoning or building codes. This approach, according to the book The Battle of Lincoln Park, usually involved court-ordered renovations, demolitions, and evictions. In 1950 in Lincoln Park, rooming houses allowed poor folks, usually single workers, young people, the elderly, to rent a bedroom with a communal bath and kitchen facilities. Zoning laws legislated those out of existence. In 1950, Lincoln Park had more than 100,000 residents. By 1970, its population was down to just 68,000. In 1950, very few homes were zoned as single family. Nowadays, it's almost one of every five. Setbacks, height limits, floor area ratios, parking requirements, minimum lot size requirements, minimum unit requirements, uh, use rules, um, uh, dwelling unit per acre rules, dwelling unit factor. It's death by a thousand cuts. It's this, it's this thicket of of arbitrary standards that have just accumulated over time. But when you actually scratch the surface a little bit and you look at the history of these rules, there's actually not really a lot of research that went into them. In many cases, they were pursuing objectives that we wouldn't even agree with today, right? Explicitly segregating the city or explicitly trying to increase housing costs or explicitly trying to make it to where you can only really get around by car. The political left brands itself as supporting the little guy, poor folks, minorities, the historically disadvantaged. But in this way, they act exactly like the conservatives they say they hate. If I told most folks on the left, hey, there's a political policy out there that makes it harder for the homeless to get homes, harder for poor people to live where they want to live, and enshrines the privilege of largely white wealthy people, they'd probably say, oh, there go those darn Republicans again. But not this time. No doubt, the right makes it too difficult for folks from other places to enter their countries, but the NIMBYs in big cities, usually on the political left, do the same thing in the same way, by leveraging government authority to keep people out of their neighborhoods. This is exhibit freaking A for why it's not the left or the right that's the problem. The institution of government itself is the problem. It's rotten to the core. Uh, NIMBY rhetoric, in many cases it sounds like uh, the rhetoric of people who uh, want to make it extremely hard to move uh, into the country. It's the exact same type of thing. We need to preserve our community character, uh, you know, the, the wrong type of person coming in, uh, you know, what is this going to mean for my bottom line? Um, there's incredible parallel between, I think, NIMBY politics and immigration exclusionary politics. I mean, zoning really is the way that we determine who is allowed to live where. It's essentially a system of, of internal checkpoints that say, Hey, unless you can, unless you make this much money, you're not allowed to live in this area. And you know, people like to tell a lot of stories about homelessness, like, oh, homelessness is a is a function of, of drug addiction or it's a function of mental health. The vast majority of folks experiencing homelessness don't have those issues. They're folks who are sleeping on couches of friends and family or sharing bedrooms with friends and family. They're folks who are sleeping in cars. Um, the folks who are on the street are an extreme example and of course a very special case, but the vast majority of people struggling with homelessness uh, are normal people who in a normal context would be able to afford a home. A context that is without arbitrary zoning laws. I told you we'd get to this example, didn't I? In a city that doesn't have zoning like Houston, um, homelessness is, is much less of an issue, but when it is an issue, it's much easier to solve. So because Houston has this large housing stock, and it's legal in Houston to build the type of inherently affordable housing uh, that helps you get people off the streets. Uh, Houston is actually able to tackle homelessness in a way that a city like Los Angeles hasn't. 
So Houston does not have the citywide systematic use segregation and density restrictions of a zoning city. Uh, it's the only major American city that doesn't have zoning. Houston not having zoning makes it easier, I think, to solve some of these other planning challenges that we're facing. Issues of making sure that everyone has access to a uh, decent, uh, affordable home. Uh, making sure that areas with environmental risks uh, are protected. Uh, making sure that folks have various options for how they get around the city and that they can do so safely. Houston's not a perfect city. It's not an all-purpose model for planning. Uh, you know, they made a lot of other city planning mistakes that most other cities made. But as I argue in the book, they didn't make one really, really important planning mistake. They didn't adopt zoning. And so as a result, uh, not by accident, Houston is one of the most affordable major cities in America. Houston, to a degree really not seen in any other city, is free to grow and adapt over time. People are free to uh, change how they use their property in real time amid changing needs and demands. Here's the bottom line on NIMBY policies, namely zoning, but also regulations on things like housing, businesses, landscape, the list goes on. They're fundamentally exclusionary. Putting restrictions on the free market for housing and land use makes it harder and more expensive for people to live where they want and inflates the prices of goods and services. These policies are anti-poor and anti-immigrant, or we could say anti the very groups that NIMBYs and affordable housing activists claim to support. Ultimately, any plan to make housing more affordable is self-defeating if it calls for increased governmental authority, because in doing so, it disrupts market forces that constantly and naturally work to bring prices down. Want to solve the housing crisis once and for all? Want to see parking lots, which are often legally required by zoning, like this one used to be at the intersection where I lived, become apartments and businesses? Want regular people to be able to afford to live on the Upper East Side of Manhattan or in Lincoln Park in Chicago? Then leave them free to do what they want with their own property. I thought Nolan absolutely killed it here. If you agree, check out another video we made with him about dead malls. He looked way different in that one.